Hello, everyone. Today, I will be speaking on dynamic and context-aware security policies for cloud using Service Mesh. This is a work done by me and my teammate, Julian Stephen. We both work at IBM Research, New York, USA. And today, Julian will be joining us through a video recording as well. Containers are the new normal, and WebAssembly is the new future. As containers are increasing in number, as organizations are shifting from monolithic to microservice architecture, containers are increasingly uh, increasing in number. And as these containers are increasing in number, so is the security standards increasing for these containers. As security standards are becoming more demanding, so is the need of more complex policies to protect cloud. So there are four Cs of cloud-native security. We approach security of cloud through four dimensions of code, container, cluster, and cloud. We, at the code level, we ensure that security has been uh, practiced at the implementation level. At the container level, we ensure security in terms of image loading while, while in the deployment. At the cluster level, we majorly focus into Kubernetes, and we talk about different aspects of security, like network policies, pod security standards, inter-service authorization, authentication, and many more. In this talk, we would be majorly focusing on inter-service authorization, but the solution that we are presenting could be generalized to different aspects of network policies, pod security standards, etc. At the cloud level, we ensure security at the infrastructure level, for example, AWS, IBM Cloud would be ensuring security at the infrastructure. So why, why do we need inter-service policies? The major reason is as the vulnerabilities and attack patterns are increasing, we are, we, we are every day we are adopting new third-party libraries and this is, this is uh, leading to more vulnerabilities and changing attack patterns. And with these, uh, with these changing attack patterns, the attacks are evolving every day. Why we need, uh, what, what this inter-service authorization will help in is it will prevent lateral movement of data. For example, we can protect sensitive data. In addition to that, we can also limit the damage that has been done during container break-ins. As well, we can also, remit, we can also apply rate limit on, on services. For example, how much, uh, how much sensitive data a service can access through the other service. But as, as these policies are coming into picture, why don't we see those policies every day? Like, why, what is the development challenge in uh, applying these inter-service policies? Major reason is complex manual intervention. So since we are talking about microservices at a very large scale, we need to ensure policies to be implemented at each service level. And doing it every day is very cumbersome for, for a chief security officer to do it at every service level. And apart from that, like with the change in dynamism of cloud, like the, the policies parameters keeps on changing over the time. And if we rely on manual intervention, it will become a major problem in uh, applying these policies. It's also very difficult to identify threshold for these policies. And in case there is, a risk, uh, there is some security standard that changes as, as in the organization, we will need to apply these policies at the manual intervention level, and that becomes very cumbersome. In addition to that, we also need a very fast in-path evaluation. So whenever an access is made, it goes through the cycle of policy evaluation. And if that becomes very slow, then the whole process becomes uh, highly non-performant. So till now, we have discussed about the motivation behind why we need inter-service policies. Next, what we will talk about is what are the solutions that we, look, that we are looking forward. We have majorly categorized two goals. One is easy policy evaluation, and another one is practical policy evaluations. So at the easy policy specification, what we, what we want is a, uh, we want the policies to be implemented at service level, and it should be an automatic way to implement those policies. In addition to that, as cloud is changing, we, we want our policies to adjust to the cl changing cloud context. And, as, and 
in addition to that, we also want our policies, if we have presented a solution, we want our solution to be generic across cluster. In practicality, what we aim for is centralized administration so that we twindle one parameter and this whole, the whole policies across the cloud is reflected. Next, we, next we, what, we, what we aim for is fast policy evaluation, that these policies are highly performant. And these policies should also be providing defense against real-time threats that, that comes every day. The solution that we are looking forward and the, the way we are approaching the solution is through Istio Service Mesh, Open Policy Agent, Metrics, and Machine Learning. So before we dig deeper into the solution, let's first talk about what's Istio Service Mesh. So Istio Service Mesh is a platform to manage, connect, and secure microservices across distributed platform. It, it is widely popular, and there are more than 12,000 consumers of Istio Service Mesh, majorly because it could be applied in diverse cloud environments. How does it work? So it is divided into two parts. One part is data plane, and another part is control plane. Within the data plane, each service has been deployed a sidecar. These sidecars are composed of Envoy proxies. These are highly performant, intelligent C++ proxies, which are responsible for controlling and mediating traffic between services. These are also responsible for collecting and reporting telemetry logs. The control plane is ma majorly the controller of these uh, sidecars, and it, it is responsible for the discovery, configuration, and certificates of these Envoy proxies. So we have seen that through Istio Service Mesh, we get the advantage of telemetry and traffic management. In addition to that, we also get an advantage of extensibility and security. By extensibility, we mean we can extend the functionality of Istio Service Mesh. That is, we could create some custom plugins and, and extend the functionality in the po policy enforcement part. And by security, we, we also try to implement some identity and authorization services. Next, we talk about Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent is a general purpose policy engine. It is also open source and widely popular. It unifies policy enforcement across stack. The major function of OPA, OPA is that it, de it decouples policy enforcement for, from policy decision. So a policy is written in Rego. It is a high-level declarative language. And the context for the policy is provided through the data section. So whenever a request is received by the service, the service queries to the OPA server. The OPA server evaluates that request against data and policy, and then gives a decision. As OPA and Rego both are domain, uh, domain agnostic, these are widely popular. Now my, huh? now my teammate Julian will join us for uh, explaining the solution architecture. Hi, uh, hello everyone. This is Julian Stephen. Now that we talked about Istio and OPA, I would like to explain how we can build on that background towards our goal of um, dynamic context-aware policies. Towards this, we will look at our high-level architecture. We will go into the relevant metrics that can be captured and curated, and the actual policy enforcement itself. Finally, we will look at how we keep these policies current or relevant to the current context of the environment. So let us build on the Istio basics we looked at. Let us focus on the shaded region here for a moment. It is a common and easy pattern now to route the service traffic that comes into the workload sidecar proxies to an authorization server. This authorization server can look at into each individual request in detail in order to make an authorization decision. For example, if it is an HTTP request for an API, the auth server can decide whether the request should be allowed or not based on a host of parameters. Some of those parameters could be in the request and some could be based on the context that we spoke about. Finally, being a decoupled policy server, OPA can play this part very well. We will go into details of each of these in the next few slides. Now, in the beginning, we also spoke about the need for policies to be simple and adapt to the environment. 
We achieve this by incorporating what we call a context server in the design shown in this purple box here. It is the job of the context server to tune the policy <coughs> according to the current state of the environment, not including all the messy, fine-grained details in policy definition also help us keep the policy nice and uh, simple and clear. Finally, to the left now, what is this context? How do we get it? How do we identify what context is relevant for our policies? Fortunately, current cloud systems offer substantial telemetry about events that occur within the cluster. And we, if we add on additional layer seven details that we get from the sidecar proxies, we can get a pretty good sense of what is really going on. Um, in my experience, I have not seen these metrics exploited beyond creating beautiful Grafana dashboards, showing node statuses and the like. But we can do more with those. Uh, we can query the metrics required for our policies from the metric server, Prometheus in this example, and we say what is relevant in a few, we say what is relevant in a few different forms. We will talk about the details in the next couple of slides. All of this becomes the base, uh, and the context server will use this base to provide appropriate information to the policies when needed. Now, let us look into the details of each of these boxes that we saw. We will start with metrics collection. What kind of metadata can we reasonably assume to have, and how do we save it? By default, without any additional configuration, the Envoy proxies exports a standard set of statistics. This typically includes statistics about source destinations, volume of data that is sent, received, etc. There are also Envoy access log filters that can give you additional information like uh, user agents or HTTP request response codes, connection, termination details, and more. And Remember, all of this comes with no additional overhead to the application developer. This is all taken care as part of the infrastructure setup. In addition to these standard metrics, depending on the kind of application, we can get metadata with more semantics by using application-specific proxies. There are already proxies for MySQL, Redis, and, and more. HTTP proxies can give you details of URL, request response, your request source principles, uh, details of JWT tokens, and so on. You can imagine if your application is using MySQL as a backend, for example, then the MySQL proxy can give you the actual queries the application is issuing against the database. So if you want to enforce policies specific to a kind of data being used, PII data, financial data, for example, this should take new significance for you right now. You can have one set of policies for PII data, another set for financial data access. Now, these metrics can always be pulled from some standard metric server like Prometheus with an appropriate configuration. But we found that it is easier to pull the specific data that we want and store it, in, store it ourselves for a variety of reasons. Part of this is perf just performance, being able to pull the relevant data already summarized in our knowledge base helps us query much smaller amounts of data much faster. Another part of this is just practicality. Time series databases typically have retention policies that is much shorter than what we would like. And if we were to set longer retention time, performance often is a, is a cost that we will have to pay. Now that we understand what kind of metadata we have access to, let us look at what kind of policies can be enforced and how. We hinted at the solution already in some of the earlier slides, but let's take a deeper look. If you look at the diagram on the right, we have service traffic coming in, denoted by number one here. This request is first intercepted by the sidecar proxies and then forwarded to the authorization server, which in our case is an OPA gRPC service. All this is pretty standard, and you can deploy these things very easily with boilerplate YAMLs. The OPA server now makes a decision whether to allow or deny the request, 
and the decision is sent back to the proxy. It's uh, number four in the picture here. And the proxy either replies with a 404 to the source saying the request is not allowed, or if the policy decision isn't allowed, then the request is forwarded or uh, sent to the workload port for actual servicing. What we are doing, which is a bit more exciting, is when the OPA is making this decision, it can rely on current environmental cues. In other words, this decision can be made in the context of current environment status. This environment status could be anything from past access rates or application or service behavior patterns, uh, workload characteristics like CPU storage. For example, the number of requests serviced in one past hour may, in the current past hour may have a bearing in allowing or denying the current request. Right. Other interesting policies are based on the context server automatically figuring out common service call patterns and disallowing services that do not fit this pattern. We also talked briefly about making policies simpler. Let us take a moment to look at an example for that. Imagine we want to force something like a least privilege principle for all service-to-service -service calls. That is, we want to have a policy which makes sure only the services that absolutely need to call one another as part of the design are allowed. If I were to implement such a high-level requirement, then I will have to sit down and write policies that look like um, my Node4j front-end application can only talk to the back-end API server, my back-end API server can only talk to my database and nothing else, that would be policy two, and so on. This means we will have to create these mappings one by one, and this is a very tedious and time-consuming process. But we can leverage the metrics that we have already collected to create these mappings automatically. And once we have these mappings, we can inject these mappings as dynamic data into our OPA server. So this is a good practical example of using dynamic context to our advantage. In this case, to enforce least privilege access for all services in the cluster, we can use this dynamic context. The Rego policy itself in this case will be very simple. It will just say only services defined in our mappings can communicate with one another. And these mappings are auto-generated. This keeps our policy simple and easy to write. And also, this makes the Rego part of this very generic. From the perspective of a security officer or a CISO, these least privileged Rego policies can be reused in as many clusters as needed. Finally, there's a last bit of performance trade-off that I want to speak of. In this example, the OPA server was deployed as an external service. We can also have this as part of the workload sidecar itself. The trade-offs here are obvious. We get faster policy authorization times, our policy response times are faster, but we will have to manage our policies better, making sure the policies related to different workloads are located in the appropriate or the correct OPA servers. Okay, finally, let us look into the details of the context server itself. We described many of the relevant pieces already, so I'll be quick on this slide. We are curating context by collecting data from different systems, and based on the kind of analysis we do on the systems, we can support different kinds of dynamic policies. Here, I will mainly speak about the different kinds of analysis that the context server can do. We, will, we can start with some of the simple behavioral analysis, the service-to-service -service mappings that we already spoke about. Uh, this is denoted by this uh, LP, least privilege mappings in this figure. We also found some practical quirks that we had to work around. All of us know that the cluster IP or pod IPs of the workload are ephemeral and can change when the application restarts. Um, the service IPs are more static, but often the, when the proxies intercept the data, they will log the cluster IPs and not the appropriate service IPs. So we found that we have to maintain a history of these application to IP mappings based on timestamp to get some of the behavioral patterns that we talked about. 
This is another example of the kind of context that we maintain and can be utilized in uh, many cases for, for many policies. Another obvious application is to create dynamic rate limits. An example where we can do more complex machine learning based analysis is to automatically identify the appropriate thresholds for many of these rate limits. We can try to learn the rate limits based on past behavior, which we will describe in a little bit. We can also envision adjusting some of these policies based on perceived threats and risk levels of your organization. This is not something we are doing right now, but it is uh, definitely yet another interesting direction. That is all for me. Uh, back to you, Sruti. So next we talk about dynamic policy threshold estimation. So we know that the dynamism and scalability of cloud demands a lot of problem. So what we need as a solution is an automatic and intelligent way to do these, to do these policy threshold updates. Also, our solution should have memories of past activity. And what could be the best solution than LSTM? LSTMs are long short memory networks. These are a type of recurrent neural networks which are capable of learning long time dependencies. These are responsible for time series prediction. So we are use, using this particular quality of LSTM in dynamic threshold prediction. As part of the algorithm, first part what we are doing is we are classifying and counting the inter-service accesses. So by classification and counting, I mean that whenever a request is made, request is classified either into read, write, update, or delete categories. And in each category, access counts are, be, are found. This particular data is supplied to the LSTM, and then LSTM works on a forecasting model and predicts threshold for the next time when. This particular policy could also be, uh, this particular algorithm could also be applied in case of PII. So for example, if you want to, uh, to count your access and classify your access at the granularity of uh, personally identifiable information, example, you want to see which service is accessing which last name how many times, so you can count those accesses and then provide it to the LSTM. And LSTM will give us a forecast of what the, what the threshold should be in the next time bin. Let's see how we are doing it. So as Julian mentioned, we will be taking metrics, passing, passing it to the ingest server, then passing it to the knowledge base. After the knowledge base, the classifier will pick up this data, will classify it into the four categories, will pre-process it and pass to the LSTM, train it, and we will get a trained model. We will look deeper into how pre-processing and featureization happens. So imagine you have a time series data of from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. You divide the entire time series data into bins of five minutes each. Within each time bin, you, for in this case, we are calculating the read access count. So each blue, blue dot in, in a bin denotes the access count for that particular duration. Now we take a sliding window approach. So for LSTM, we need an X and Y label. The window is of size three. So we provide, uh, provide data for this, this time, time window. And then we create a label. Since we are doing a supervised classification, we create a lab label X4, which is the predicted count for the next time window. And then we provide this X and Y label to the LSTM for learning. Since now we have a trained model, at the inference stage, when we are doing policy evaluations and policy creations, this, uh, this trained model is passed through a past data. And this, this trained model gives us a prediction of threshold in the next time bin. As a request is received by the OPA server, it is evaluated against the threshold counts. And if, the, uh, if access is allowed, then uh, the decision is made. How we can use this uh, predicted threshold algorithm in case of uh, policy enforcement and evaluation is this. We have it at the inference stage. We, have, we will take data for past time. We will pass it through the TAIN model. So as you can see from 9.40 to 9.45 AM, we have a predicted count. In the real time, we will also keep on counting the number of accesses made and we will compare the predicted count with the real-time accesses. If the error threshold between the 
uh, predicted and the uh, real time count is more than what is required, then it will pr produce a deny as could be evident in, in the time bin of 9.55 to 10 a.m. We can also look deeper into the policy of how we are providing the dynamic context. So we, if you see the service access threshold map, this is nothing but the, the, the threshold map between a service and allowed count for that service. And this comes from the LSTM model. And then we have a service access count map, which is basically the real time access count for a service. With this, we come, out, come to the end of the presentation and now we will get to the demo part. How is, how is the demo set up? Is we, we are not showing the LSTM threshold prediction part in this demo. We are majorly focusing on the dynamic policies created for least privilege access. The application that we are taking into account is Book Info application. As part of this application, the Book Info page talks to product page, reviews, and details application. And all of the communication in this application are protected through MTLS. The policy that we will be creating, this policy is created in Rego. The dynamic context that has been provided is in terms of destination to source map, which is nothing but, but uh, a, a source map of how, which source is allowed to access a particular destination. An example of that is uh, as evident. We have product page that could only be accessed by ingress gateway. Reviews can only be accessed by product page, etc. We evaluate our uh, uh, policy enforcement through against log4j attack. And let's see if that works or not. So as first part of the demo, we are trying to show how log4j attack is successful when no policies have been enforced. So here, first we are showing how Book Info application works. So you can see it talks to the details microservice, reviews microservice, and gives reviews of, of a certain book. Next, we start a malicious JNDI server. So we look at uh, what are the uh, pods which are deployed as part of the book info namespace. And we see that there is a vulnerable app that has been deployed there. So as part of log4j exploit, this vulnerable app will talk to the JNDI servers to ex execute arbitrary code. So as part of this attack, what we are trying to do is vulnerable app is trying to talk to ratings microservice, which is, which is not allowed. And it's trying to encode, it, it is trying to, trying to base 64 encode the uh, a get request to ratings app and get uh, data related to ratings app. So now when we issue a curl request to the vulnerable app, we will provide a base64 encoding to the vulnerable app. So you see the curl uh, command was successful and we get a hello world. In the GNDI server, we get a 200 response. When we check in the vulnerable app, if the file was made and if the data from the ratings app was stored or not. So we, fee we see that a sample file has been created and let's see the content of that file. So we see that the attack has been successful. Next, 
part of the demo, we are focusing on applying our, enforcing our policies and applying our context server to get the source destination mapping. And let's see if that happens. In this part, we will basically be starting our source destination recording and providing that dynamic context to the policy. So we start our source destination recording. So you can see source destination recording is up. Then we try to curl the data context of, of uh, OPA server, and we see that the destination to source mapping has been recorded. So here we see that details could only be accessed by product page V1. Product page V1 could only be accessed by in Istio Ingress Gateway. Now in the other part, we will see if we issue the same curl request, will the attack be successful or not? So we issued the curl request, it looks okay. Now when we check at the temp folder, there's no file that has been made. And book info application is also happy. Like what we mean here is that without with the enforcement of our policies, book and book info application works the way it is supposed to be. But the J, but the log four J exploit has not been successful. So. Um, this brings uh, to the, me to the last, of, last part of the presentation. We can apply this technique for different part of policy definitions at different aspects of cluster security. This, this uh, process could also be applied for app behavior modeling, and we can use it for detecting malicious attacks. We would also be extending this particular technology, this, uh, this solution, to identify if there are various policy needs in different aspects and we can apply the same thing of threshold prediction. And the major uh, limitation or uh, improvement that we want to do in the future is quantifying impact, which is whenever a prediction is made, there are various external conditions that keeps on changing. So in, in the forecasting, we need to take into account what are the external factors that are changing within an organization. For example, the risk threshold might change. So we, in the future, we will also be taking into account all these factors. This brings me to the end of the presentation. Thanks, everyone. Please let me know if you have any questions. So, uh, so in our first experimentations, we actually used authorization policy, the predefined authorization policy, but it has certain limitations. Uh, with this uh, particular component of, uh, of including OPA server in policy evaluation path, you can extend uh, the functionality. For example, when, when you want your threshold counts to be calculated as part of LSTM, you can include that as part of uh, the policy evaluation. So whenever a request is made to a service, that gets redirected to the external authorization server. And this server can perform whatever you want them to perform. So it's basically extending the functionality, which you normally don't see in authori predefined authorization policy of Istio. Any more questions? <laughs> so it, it depends. Like all the LSTM models suffer from a concept drift. Like 
every machine learning suffers from a concept, concept drift. So what happens is if we see that the error threshold that, that I was talking about, if it, it is varying a lot, then we can set up an algorithm which could retrain the model, assuming that there might be a concept drift in that case. So uh, right now, we haven't implemented that part, but I am assuming that we can do a statistical analysis of that concept drift and keep an account of that in our evaluations. Uh, so we are still working towards like open sourcing it. Uh, we haven't open sourced. We just like file a patent for this. And uh, um, but in the future, we are trying to release it as an operator in OpenShift. So we would probably have uh, documentation related to that. <laughs> 